Today we remember an important piece of Simsbury's past at a time when it seems that the present is filled with growing uncertainty. I'm pleased that Joel Murchison could be with us here today for keynote address titled Living the Dream in Times of Trouble. Trouble indeed. The FBI tells us that white nationalism is one of the greatest homegrown threats to our country. The news is full of examples of people calling police when they witness otherwise lawful activities like napping, golfing, swimming, even babysitting. And I've heard people wonder aloud why a town like Simsbury holds an annual MLK commemoration. Why does a town that is far less diverse than the country, even the county that it's in, carry this mantle? And as many of you know, we're not stopping there at a ceremony once a year. We've already been talking about it a little bit. But this history is being memorialized by a, a monument that's being erected just steps from here in front of the Simsbury Street Library. I believe that it's not only appropriate that Simsbury is helping carry this mantle, but it's essential. What's particularly heartening to me is the monument is not the brainchild of politicians, not the brainchild of educators or even the historical society. I'm never going to forget standing at the groundbreaking in the pouring rain and seeing students front and center. Students. Students from our amazing high school who were inspired to learn about the summers Martin Luther King spent in Simsbury, working in tobacco fields. Students who were inspired to learn more and unearthing details of that little known piece of Simsbury's past. Students passionate that future generations of Simsbury residents would never forget that piece of our past, our town's small contribution to the civil rights movement. I have a daughter who's six years old, and I have no doubt that she'll be learning more about civil rights in, in school. Um, we've taken out some books from the library. But to be able to share with our children the story of Dr. King, and then take them to the church where he worshipped, show them the fields where he worked, and discuss how the time we spent up north in our community contributed in a small way to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, I think that's how we begin to make history real. Turning on the news in 2019 can be a reminder that the world does not follow a linear path toward progress, but learning from the past and making the past feel as real as the present is how we ensure that future generations carry this mantle, which is why I'm glad that this monument is going to be a site of future field trips. I'm glad that Dr. King's time in Simsbury will be embedded in our school's curriculum, and I'm particularly excited that it's current students who are helping drive this work forward. Thank you. distinction, 
to lead the parade. Alfred Adler, the great psychoanalyst, contends that this is the dominant impulse. This quest for recognition, this desire for attention, this desire for distinction. There comes a time that the drum major instinct can become destructive. And that's where I want to move now. I want to move to the point of saying that if this instinct is not harnessed, it becomes a very dangerous, <coughs> pernicious instinct. For instance, if it isn't harnessed, it causes one's personality to be distorted. And the great tragedy of the distorted personality is the fact that when one fails to harness this instinct, he ends up trying to push others down in order to push himself up. And whenever you do that, you engage in some of the most vicious activities. Now the other problem is, when you don't harness the drum major instinct, this uncontrolled aspect of it, is that it leads to snobbish exclusivism. And you know, this is the danger of social clubs and fraternities. I'm in a fraternity. I'm in two or three. For sororities and for all of these, I'm not talking against them. I'm saying it's the danger. The danger is that they can become forces of classism and exclusivism, where somehow you get a degree of satisfaction because you are in something exclusive. The drum nature instinct can lead to exclusivism in one's thinking and can lead one to feel that because he has some training, he's a little bit better than that person who doesn't have it. Or because he has some economic security, that he's a little better than the person who doesn't have it. And that's the uncontrolled, perverted use of the drum major instinct. But this is why we are drifting. And we are drifting there because nations are caught up with the drum major instinct. I must be first. I must be supreme. Our nation must rule the world. And I'm sad to say that the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit. And I'm going to continue to say it to America because I love this country too much to see the drift it has taken. God didn't call America to do what she's doing in the world now. And we won't stop it because of our pride and our arrogance as a nation. And we have perverted the drum major instinct. And every now and then, I think about my own death. And I think about my funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I once said? And I leave the word to you this morning. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, Tell them to talk, not talk too long. And every now and then, I wonder, what do I want them to say? Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. And I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day 
that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who are naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things won't matter. I won't have the money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say.
second reading is selections from Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution, delivered at the National Cathedral on March 31st, 1968. Um, Senator Rickos uh, was going to join us today. Unfortunately, he sends his regrets. He works in his other uh, job as a uh, forever source, and they're still working on uh, power outages throughout the state. Um, so, Angela Griffin, who's part of our committee, um, is going to read. And I just want to thank Angela for her incredible service to the town of Simsbury. She's in charge of the music program for the entire town of Simsbury, all the schools, and does such amazing work as, as you'll see today. And, and all the performances um, that you'll see over the years. We're so blessed to have her, and uh, she'll join us right now to offer the second reading. Thank you, Angela. Selections from remain, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution, delivered at the National Cathedral, Washington, D.C., on March 31st, 1968. I was five years old. It is always a rich and rewarding experience to take a brief break from our day-to-day -day demands and the struggle for freedom and human dignity, and discuss the issues involved in that struggle which concerned friends of goodwill all over our nation. I'm sure that most of you have read that, have read that arresting link story from the pen of Washington Irving entitled Rip Van Winkle. The one thing that we usually remember about the story is that Rip Van Winkle slept 20 years. But there was another point in that little story that is almost completely overlooked. It was the sign in the end from which Rip went up in the mountain for his long sleep. When Rip Van Winkle went up into the mountain, the sign had a great picture of King George III of England. When he came down 20 years later, the sign had a picture of George Washington, the first president of the United States. When Rip Van Winkle looked up at the picture of George Washington, and looking at the picture, he was amazed. He was completely lost. He knew not who he was. And this reveals to us that the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that Rip slept 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountain, a revolution was taking place that at points would change the course of history, and Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. Yes, he slept through a revolution. And one of the great liabilities of life is that all too many people find themselves living amid a great period of social change, and yet they fail to develop the new attitudes, the new mental responses that the new situation demands. They end up sleeping through revolution. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that a great revolution is taking place in the world today. In a sense, it is a triple revolution, that is, a technological revolution with the impact of automation and cybernation. Then there is a revolution in weaponry with the emergence of atomic and nuclear weapons of warfare. Then there is a human rights revolution with the freedom explosion that is taking place all over the world. Yes, we do live in a period where changes are taking place. And there is still the voice crying through the vista of time saying, Behold, I make all things new. Former things are passed away. Now whenever anything new comes into history, it brings with it new challenges and new opportunities. And I would like to deal with the challenges that we face today as a result of this triple revolution that is taking place in the world today. We are challenged to develop a world perspective. No individual can live alone, no nation can live alone, and anyone who feels that he can live alone is sleeping through a revolution. Through our scientific and technological genius, we have made of this world a neighborhood, and yet we have not had the ethical commitment to make of it a brotherhood. But somehow and in some way, we have got to do this. We must all learn to live together as brothers or we 
we will all perish together as fools. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one direct and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you could never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we must help time and realize that the time is always right to do right.
Selections from Dr. King's Letter from a Birmingham Jail, written in 1963. It'll be read by Brad Lee, who is an incredible community volunteer, uh, business leader, scout leader, and uh, we asked him to come up for a special reason.
Ashita Dayaka and Robin Amadou. And we're going to ask them to come up and give a progress report on the memorial. They would do so now. That'd be great. Thank you. I'd also just like to thank the rest of the MLK and CT committee who are seated right there. In the summer of 1944, a freshman from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, arrived in Connecticut to begin working in the tobacco fields here in Simsbury. In letters home to his mother, he would talk about how he and other students would work hard during the week and spend their weekends playing baseball with local boys or going into town. On Sundays, they would come here to the First Church of Christ to attend an integrated service. This particular student, just 15 years old, was selected to be the religious leader for the group of young men and led meetings at the dorms where topics such as changing the world and contributing to society were discussed. He would go out to Hartford with his classmates and eat at some of the finest restaurants without being denied service. He would go swimming in the Farmington River, get milkshakes at the local drugstore, and go see films down the road at Eno Hall and not be judged by the color of his skin. His name was Martin Luther King Jr. Returning to the segregated South was a painful experience for King, as he and the other students could sit anywhere they liked on the train to Washington, D.C., but would then have to switch to a Jim Crow car to travel further down into the south of Georgia. Martin Luther King Jr. believed that life could be different for all. The two summers he spent in Connecticut were contributing compounding, leading to his decision to become a minister. He applied to Crozier Theological Seminary School in Chester, Pennsylvania, and described his call to ministry as quite different from most explanations either. This decision came about in the summer of 1944, when he felt an inescapable urge to serve society. In short, he felt a sense of responsibility which he could not escape. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would go on to dedicate his life towards justice, peace, and tranquility. The MLK and CT Committee has designed and raised the funds for creating a permanent memorial in Simsbury. This past fall, we broke ground and anticipate its dedication this summer. The memorial will be a place where people can come to learn about his mission and his time spent in Simsbury. It is important to acknowledge that the memorial is not just a monument, but rather a place where people can sit, reflect, and learn about Dr. King. This memorial includes a series of five glass panels that each discuss different aspects of his life. On all of the panels, the written etched text appears to be to flow as supported. The glass was chosen to reflect the idea that his words are not meant to be bound by walls, but to be understood and reflected upon all people. There will be entry and exit markers made from brownstone used in many of Simsbury's historical buildings an event made of Georgia Granite, where MLK is from. The memorial will be located in the center of town on the ground of Simsbury Free Library. We hope people who visit will be educated, engaged, and inspired towards self-correction. We want people to visit this memorial and realize the impact that they can have on the world. As kids, we've visited many historical landmarks, so we especially want students from all over Connecticut to come to Simsbury and see the memorial so that it can serve as a place where students can be and really be inspired. Dr. King was around our age when he walked in the streets. He faced similar decisions about what path his future might take, and he ended up changing the world in a very monumental way, and we should aspire to continue his legacy any way we can. To think that Simsbury played even a small role in inspiring such a great leader is extraordinary. Dr. King's mission of civil rights work to change to just not the United States, but people all over around the globe with this nonviolent movement against racism. This memorial serves to educate people about the struggle that existed then, but also continues to exist today, to obtain equal rights, and how Martin Luther King dedicated his life to the peaceful pursuit of equality. We need to keep his work alive. Each one of us has the opportunity to improve ourselves and our communities through tolerance, acceptance, and kindness. If you would like to watch our documentary about Martin Luther King and CD, we are very happy to be able to present it in the chapel after this event. Our group will also be holding a big show in the lobby. 
please come by if you have any questions.
Smith, Ms. Murchison is the founder and principal of Exec Mommy Group and Inclusion, Communication, Leadership, and Consulting Practice, where she combines her passion and interest in education, equity and inclusion, policy and communication with her experience as an administrator and adjunct professor. In addition to her professional accolades, Ms. Murchison is a proud mother of four and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Ms. Murchison is an exuberant, positive, outgoing individual who embraces life and embodies the principles that Dr. King stood for. She is a champion for humanity and an advocate for equal access in the lives of others. Ms. Murchison inspires those around her to identify potential paths that lead to greatness, encouraging those around her to push beyond the boundaries of mere existence and to maximize their potential. Graceful, gracious, grounded, and a powerful voice for community. I present to you our keynote speaker for the MLK Day Celebration Program 2019, Ms. Joelle Murchison. for the opportunity to be here. We were actually in the same place last Sunday around, oh, today's Monday. Last Sunday, around this time, celebrating our shared friend, the Reverend David M. McAllister. Um, so it is an honor to be here in your, um, your home. So I, I first have to thank Angela for the invitation today because it is really as a result of Angela's tenacity that I am here in Simsbury for the fourth time in my life. Um, two times at Simsbury High School, one of those times because Angela so graciously invited me to be with all of the teachers at the high school on a professional development day to help them begin to reimagine what inclusion would look like in a community as aptly described by your first selectman, where visibly diversity might not be the first thing that you would use to describe Simsbury. <laughs> Um, so I, I was really honored when after that um, day that we shared together that morning at the high school that Angela called me and said, we would love for you to come and be our speaker for MLK this year. So I was honored. I thank you, Angela, for your leadership in this community. Um, there are always those who need to help bring voice to the voices that may not be at the table. And so Angela, you have been such a wonderful champion of justice and the willingness to have dialogue here. So I thank you. And I thank all of the committee. And so um, I, I'm going to actually begin. It's funny when you have prepared remarks that I typically speak separately. I just had to look down and remember that I had prepared remarks. Um, so let me use them. <laughs> what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up? like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over, like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? That was written by the incomparable Langston Hughes, and is the way that I chose to begin our conversations today about living the dream in troubled times. So I've already extended my thanks. This is the problem of not really using um, prepared remarks and then having to look down at them. Um, I thank you all for not being selfish with your time and using this day off as a day on. It is important that we continue to live the legacy of Dr. King, and so in spite of the chilly and I might add to <laughs> whether outside here in Connecticut you all pressed your way to be here, and I thank you for your commitment to doing that. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the program participants for taking the time to spend a moment with Dr. King's words. And in particular, I'd like to thank the students, both those represented in the intonations as well as those from Henry James School, for your role in today's program. Because it is truly you that we are dependent on. 
up until a few days ago, I knew or thought I knew exactly what I was going to talk about. I was inspired by the presence of new voices in our country who had begun to speak with authenticity. Therein I saw hope and the future for this country. Individuals, including people who look like me and share experiences like mine, who have begun to take space, so to speak, at tables and in spaces that had often been closed to individuals with different perspectives. And then the committee shared with me that an individual had written a letter taking issue with the title of the speech, which, though developed by the committee, I personally was moved by. The title, as I interpreted it, Living the Dream in Times of Trouble, was not intended at all to focus on the cause of the trouble or to place blame on any one individual, segment, or particular party as the root of the trouble, but rather to put forth some reasons that we might find to continue to live the dream, to find a way forward, if you will, in spite of all the noise we hear daily, to hold out hope, to seize an opportunity to inspire and motivate us to indeed hold fast to that dream, not to focus on the trouble. I guess it's safe to say that that's not how that individual saw it. The criticism I can only imagine was based on assumption. And some of us who are a little more set seasoned in the sanctuary today will remember the admonition of Tony Fandle in The Odd Couple about what happens when you assume. <laughs> <laughs> Students in the room, let's just say that making assumptions can get you into a little bit of trouble. But I digress. The individual had attempted to read between the lines of the title of a speech that had not yet been delivered. The assumption made, as shared with me, was that the troubled times would be equated to a certain political figure. I became both saddened and optimistic at the same time. Saddened because it only further confirms that we are a society with limited capacity to open our ears, hearts, and minds, to give the benefit of the doubt, to seek first to understand. Why, before one word had been uttered, was there an assumption made about what would be said? Sadly, in our society today, we operate on sound bites. And of course, nowadays, there are only two sides, polar opposites. So, in the voice of that person, well, I'm not sure who it is, surely this diversity and inclusion champion, I'm pretty sure the person who moved me, and I could not possibly agree Therefore, I've decided that I'm going to complain about something that she's going to say, though I don't quite know yet what she's going to say. <laughs> and in fact, maybe my complaints would silence the message. Maybe even, as I've personally experienced in my lifetime, maybe even disparage the individual so as to place fear in the hearts and minds of those who sought out to step forward to put the service forward. We won't go there. For some reason, we have diminished our capacity to take the time to really discern what people are saying. We jump to conclusions, and as a result, many of us only receive our information from quick texts, tweets, push notifications, and messages rolling across our screens. We do not largely take the time to stop, seek understanding, and engage in dialogue or for that matter, to verify what we think we know, or have even read, is even true. We believe that we all must ascribe to one position or another. There's no middle ground, no gray. No curiosity, no ability to learn, and certainly no empathy. But, as I said, I was also optimistic. I love a good challenge. And if there's one thing that motivates me is when people make assumptions about who I am. So I said to myself, bring it on. <laughs> so, 
I should say this is what happens when you have prepared remarks and you don't say it. Thank you to my wonderful, fantastic family, friends, and sorority sisters who are here celebrating me. I thank you so much for traveling over the mountain. <laughs>
never again. And prior to his delivery of the speech on that historic day, it actually contained no references to dreams at all. Yet because he repeated the now familiar phrase, I have dreams, eight times in the speech, with six specific dreams articulated, we have held on to I have a dream as a call to action. <laughs> Interestingly enough, he actually used the phrase let freedom ring ten times in the speech. Well, that was actually from an excerpt taken from a speech delivered in 1952 at the Republican National Convention by Reverend Archibald Carey, a judge and lawyer from the South Side of Chicago. Anybody know that? <laughs> I have a dream, though not highly celebrated until after Dr. King's death in 1968, called out his dreams extemporaneously on that August day in 1963. He dreamt that one day our nation would truly embrace its creed that all men are created equal. That one day sons of slaves and sons of former slave owners in Georgia would be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. He dreamed that Mississippi would be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice that his four children would live in a nation where they would be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. He dreamed that in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls would be able to join hands with little white girls and little white boys as brothers and sisters. He dreamed that one day, every valley would be exalted, that the crooked places would be made straight. He went on to explain, this is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. My friends, our troubled times are indeed a mountain of despair, but we can find hope. In fact, we need a glimmer of hope. In every day, in every minute, because there's so much in our world that could leave us hopeless. Hope as a noun is defined as a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen, or a feeling of trust. It's synonyms to aspire for, to wish for, to dream. The night before Dr. King delivered the I Have a Dream speech, the story goes that his trusted advisor, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, cautioned him against using the dream rhetoric, which he used in prior speeches. Walker thought it to be a bit trite and somewhat cliche. Interesting. But as it was told, famous gospel singer Mahalia Jackson spoke to Martin on that day and said, Martin, tell him about your dream. And he was inspired to begin to share what he believed to be our future. We are grateful to Martin King for giving us that dream then and allowing us through his legacy to revisit it today. Because in this moment and in this time, we need to hold on to his dream more than ever. Can you imagine what it must feel like to have no hope? In his writings, Cornell West talks about a concept called nihilism, the absence of hope, a complete sense of worthlessness. Now, let's be honest. We've all felt that at times. I know personally, I could spend just a little bit of time reading the news, and almost de uh, immediately a sense of despair comes over me. Just when I think it can't get any worse, I'm constantly shaking my head. SMH and social media speed. <laughs> I actually am trying to figure out what is taking Facebook so long to create an SMH emoji. Since we all type it all the time. <laughs> Even worse, the news is so bad some days that some of us have become desensitized. And it seems not to bother us at all. We go along our merry way. We just assume that things at some point will change, and then they don't. Some of us have given up hope. We have forgotten, though, that in order to have hope, we must have hope, expectation, and belief. 
It is not enough to simply expect something to be different without believing that it in fact will be different and taking action to ensure that that change does occur. I too have a dream. I am confident that someday our world will be a better place, that there will be a cure to the illnesses that plague our bodies, that one day guns and violence will not be a solution, and that one day we will all truly see one another as human beings, that we will seek to understand and embrace rather than segregate, exclude, and cause harm. And because of that, I'm filled with hope. We are still living this dream in times of trouble, but we must not give up hope. Each and every one of us must continue to believe that although times seem bleak, we can individually ensure that Dr. King's dream will come true. We must, however, dispense with fear. Ignorance breeds fear. And all ignorance is is a lack of knowledge. It's fear that causes us to retreat to our polarizing corners. The irrational fear that if only everyone in this country would have universal access to opportunity, that somehow some of us would lose out. And so we get defensive and we dig in our heels and we don't seek to understand. We allow the biases that become so ingrained in us to drive our decisions and our actions. And unfortunately, we don't realize that we too stand to be hurt and to miss out when we deny others a right to breathe, to live, to love in the way that feels right for them. My friends, instead of fear, it is our responsibility to spread just a little bit of hope to all of those around us. Will you join me in my dream as I hold on to hope, the hope that we can all become comfortable with how other people experience this world? It's as simple as that. Hope, how other people experience this world. That's what we're afraid of. If it's not like our experience, it must not be right. So how can we begin to embrace that hope? If we stay closed off in our own enclaves, we will never be able to understand the perspectives and challenges of our brothers and sisters, one to another. If we don't learn to ask questions and to seek understanding, we will never uncover how other people experience this world. And that is our challenge. We are all humanity. Martin King saw that. He saw that when he traveled here. In spite of what he had to experience that we don't read in the historical accounts, he knew that no matter the level of pigment in our skin or dialect in our language, who we love, the zip code we live in, or the name we call God, that we are all humanity. Hope, how other people experience this world? How do other people experience this community? Stop and ask yourselves, do you have the capability to extend hope? One of the other points that Dr. King uses in the I Have a Dream speech that deeply resonates with me is the fierce urgency of now. He said, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. <coughs> Friends, now is our time. The winds of change are happening all across this country. Each day that we allow fear to rule and prevent us from seeing the benefit of a nation of people who can leverage the skills, experiences, and contributions of all of its citizens, we allow Martin King's dream to die. A raisin in the hot sun of injustice and oppression, it will surely shiver up. Never think that what each and every one of you can do is insignificant, but also know that we are stronger together. In 1967, Dr. King says, if we are to have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. 
Our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, and our nation. Lastly, in the I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King said that he refuses to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great ball of opportunity in this nation. That phrase moves me, and hopefully all of you, to action. You see, it would be very easy for us to be called to despair when we recognize that our society has not paid up to this day on our debt of injustice. I am hard-pressed not to acknowledge the multitude of issues that stand in our face as a nation and cause great pain directly and indirectly to many of us even gathered here today. Immigration, gun control, discrimination, to name a few. I simply can't believe that this is the nation that we are called to be. We must challenge ourselves to learn how other people experience this world and seek out to create change when we learn that our experiences have been less than equitable. The band Green Day wrote a song a couple of years ago entitled Troubled Times. It begins with the line, what good is love and peace on earth when it's exclusive? <coughs> Justice and equality should not be exclusive. Justice and equality should make, be made available for all. The song goes on to say, what part of history we learn when it's repeated some things will never overcome if we don't seek it. We will sing together, we shall overcome in just a few moments, like any respectable MLK celebration. <laughs> <laughs> but I challenge you beyond that moment to create an action in your overcoming. What will you do to embrace hope, to seek hope, to share hope, not to give up hope, Let's not walk out here today expecting the verses of the song to do the work for us. Deep in your heart, do you really believe that we will overcome? We will only overcome if we all take action. We must not allow Dr. King's dream to become a dream deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? That dream today is indeed a heavy load, but the urgency of now says that we must not let it explode. Let us come together to learn let us come together to dream. Let us come together to hope. I'm living the dream today in spite of times of trouble. I'm holding out hope. Won't you join me? We shall overcome.
uh, holding up the memory of Dr. King and the way that you as a community have embraced this story and this part of Dr. King's journey in his formative years. Um, I will share with you that I had I had the pleasure as a group I belong to and students from Simsbury came to speak to us about the project and about raising money, right? And so we ultimately gave money to, to support the initiative. Um, and I was generally aware of the connection with Dr. King and Simsbury, but the, the students are greatly deep in my understanding along with the others as part of this. Which, fast forward to last summer, I was, I was blessed to uh, spend a day with Martin Luther King uh, III. And because of that experience, because of the work that's being done by students in Simsbury, I was able to share and deepen uh, Dr. King's son's understanding of his role uh, in Connecticut and in Simsbury in particular. And so, um, so Simsbury as a community and to the students in particular, uh, thank you for, for doing that. Um, it was interesting, a song that struck me, or it was I Choose Love. I choose love, right? And, and I'm going to read a quote by Dr. King, uh, a short one, but it's, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And I think in, in this time where our country is, right, and the division and the, the hatred, the bitterness, bitterness, the partisanship, we need to, on this day and every day, uh, think about the foundation of Dr. King's message, which is rooted in love. Love for all people, love for community, love for society. Um, the second uh, point of three I'd like to touch upon is Dr. King's story is rooted in courage. It's rooted in courage. And, and it's the courage, as Joel talked about, um, there's a different level of courage in singing, we shall overcome. Um, but it takes courage to do the work. To stand up. It takes courage to challenge people like me in offices uh, representing the state. Uh, or it takes courage for people like me in offices like this to speak up for the voiceless. Uh, it takes courage to continue the mission. Um, and so that's, that's the second two points. The third is hope. And it's, it's just so interesting that you spend a lot of time to talk about hope. And uh, I am hopeful. <clears throat> Simsbury makes me hopeful. Uh, what students, and I say change comes from young people. That's been the case not just in our country, just all over the world. And I am hopeful by what I see. And Dr. King said that the art of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. And I want to say, on this day, stay focused on the dream, the work, the overcoming, the fact that we're not done, but that uh, we're going to get there. We are going to get there through work like this um, and the stuff that we'll do the rest of the days of the year. Um, I'm standing here before you, and uh, a wonderful congresswoman is coming right after me. We are a testament to the work that's been done, uh, but we are not proof that the work is done. Thank you. Hello, Sincere. <laughs> it is 
privilege to stand before you as your Congresswoman for the 5th Congressional District. I was thinking about what I would say. Um, nothing in my life, I could have never imagined that our, our paths would cross in this way. Yet here I stand. And I have to believe that it is not by accident. I am a person who has always been deeply inspired by the words and the works of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm a history teacher, and that's what we do. And Dr. King said, our lives begin to end the day we come silent about things that matter. And over the last couple of years, many things have happened that mattered to me. And the way I decided to not be silent was to run for Congress. <laughs> that may not be everyone's path or everyone's journey, but I learned so much along the way. And I realized that I've had a series of life lessons that helped me to get here. As a teacher, I was called many times by my school administrator to say, I need you to take this kid in your class. This student is struggling, and I need a teacher who has patience and understanding and will work with them. I promise you, I never once said to my principal, is that student black or white? I've had students come to my door in the morning and ask for a snack because they were hungry, or come to my class at the end of the day crying, needing a shoulder to lean on and an ear just to listen. And I promise you, never once did I stop and say, are your parents Republican or Democrat? <laughs> so I think at this moment, we are at an inflection point in history. And we are tasked with answering what Dr. King called the most urgent and persistent question of our time. And that is, what are you doing for others? And what I've learned in my very short life is that no matter who we are, how little or how much we have, every single one of us has the ability and the capacity to give. As a teacher, as the Connecticut Teacher of the Year, as the National Teacher of the Year, I put forth a platform of service. Service above self. Service for others. Investment in community. And I saw what happened when people invested in their community. I saw what happened when there was a heightened sense of obligation. I continue to see what happens. Sean what I just talked about hope. When I started my campaign, someone said to me, hope is not a strategy. I beg to differ, because sometimes hope is all we have. There is so much fear so much doubt, so much devaluing of oneself when you are the first to do anything. There's the fear of the unknown. Will I be good enough? Will they hear what I tried to say? Will they understand what my intention was? But I can tell you, as Dr. King also said, faith is taking that first step even when you don't see the stairway. And I can tell you that in the last two years, five years, ten years, my entire life, there were so many opportunities where I felt like I should have stood up. I should have said something. And I can tell you that I am at a time in my life, I am at a place in history where I'm not throwing away my shot. And if the moment comes, my voice to speak up for the least of us, to help people understand that we are so much better together, that we are more similar, that we are different, and that hope is a strategy. Thank you so much.
beginning of many visits to uh, the sanctuary. Congratulations. We're so very proud. So, um, Father Albright, I have to apologize that I skipped over your prayer. <laughs> so we've never had enough prayer. Um, so I'm going to ask you and your fellow freshmen, um, Pastor Hock, to tag team them once again, as we've done before, and offer uh, your prayers. Please take them up. Uh, you're so We're so blessed to have you. So please, both of you, come up. with 
the message of hope, that you would continue to, to supply the power to live by faith, and that you give us the grace, particularly in an age where disagreement is so intense, that we might be able to live by love, even with those who are our enemies. Send us out, Lord. Send us out to do the work you have given us to do. And thank you that your spirit can raise up a person like this to catch our imaginations that we might give our lives in the same way. Amen. Before we uh, adjourn, uh, we will close uh, the pre show for come. I just wanted to remind folks that uh, there will be a uh, fake sale and uh, the side room here, a display of the memorial um, and a showing of the documentary made in 2010 for folks to enjoy. I wanted to thank all of you for being here and for celebrating the Martin Luther King Day 2019. And um, we'd ask you to join us in singing We Shall Overcome. It's in your hymnal. Uh, if, you, if you don't know the words, uh, on number 476. And we're going to do verses 1, 2, and 6. And I think the intonations are going to uh, lead us along with the Henry James Memorial Choir. Thank you so much. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.